of you know something that's about Flashpoint that you don't know about Flashpoint, I want to share with you uh, just a way of thinking about startups, a way of thinking about what we're doing at Flashpoint to try to, uh, to bring you in. And what I was saying before is I noticed speed getting very close to the edge. I wondered if that was like a rhetorical technique to, you know, as you get closer, people are getting more nervous and they wake you up. If I'm getting closer, it's because I'm not noticing. So I someone would shout out, someone who cares would shout out and let, me, and let me know. And by the way, some of the teams who find that what we do with them is kind of tough. I can understand why they may not shout out. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of uh, Flashpoint. Flashpoint is uh, literally across the street and down the road, you know, meters from here. Uh, I welcome you to come. It's not an open environment, but I do welcome you to come. Uh, and find out how we're doing things. It's quite different than anything that you might uh, imagine. I want to share with you uh, a little bit of what that is. Uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd start by saying, like, just to authenticate with you, here's how startups are thought to go. I mean, this is, this is I'm going to tell you, like, how do people think the startups go? Or, or even worse, like, how do they actually run their startups? Uh, you know, the best thing I could think of was, like, to say, it's like a movie. It's like a movie. You know Ayn Rand? Uh, so she invented this great character of war. You must know this story. You, you must. Someone, every, everybody goes through college, they have to read Ayn Rand and read for a while to think that that's the way the world actually works. And so, you know, in this story, uh, Fountainhead, there's a protagonist, Roy. And his, he's like the protagonist in most startups. He has a vision of the future. You know, he's a maker, he's a creator. He's someone who can actually see how the world is, and he decides. We need one of these in the world, and if we had one of these in the world, there would be a lot of value created. So what he does is he finds backers. He finds people who have a shared vision that he can actually create with them. And when he gets the backers in the right mindset, they become huge supporters. And they say to him things like, you know, you're unknown, but you're famous for this thing. And then with the money and the resources and the, and the team around, you build stuff. You figure out what it is. You spend time with the customers. You understand what needs to be, what needs to get built, and you build it. And by the way, it's hard work. Everybody expects it. it's going to be hard work. Everybody's into it. They wear the hard hats. They're going to look like they're doing a startup. And they're going to go through concrete. They don't care. And everybody figures it's going to be hard. And in the middle, you figure it's going to be hard, and you have a vision, and no one's going to believe you. But there'll always be someone around who will tell you what you're doing is right. You know, it's noble. There's so little that's noble and beautiful in life. You be the startup founder. You make it happen. And so you say, I can do it. <laughs> you think you're right. And you do. Because you're pretty sure that when you get it right, the world will be the path to your door. And you'll be successful. And that'll be your office. <laughs> okay. So I wanna, I'm here to tell you actually something you already know, which is uh, you know, how do startups normally go? How do they actually go? Well, that's a different movie altogether. That's more like this movie. <laughs> in this movie, there is the protagonist. There is the guy like Rourke who has a vision in his mind. He's pretty clear in his head what it is his customer wants. In fact, he thinks he can actually put that idea in his customer's head. If only he builds the world around his customer just right. And he can do that because he can pull together a team. And these guys, when he pulls together, have the chops. They can work together. They can pose, they, can, they have their weapons, they have experience, and they're going to work well as a team to get to the vision that they all share. Now the only problem when the action startup goes is this is really what's going on. They're all dreaming. They're plugged in, and they're constructing a world that's not real. That's what they're doing in their startups. And the problem with this start with a dream is that it not only feels real, but they, you can't tell the difference between the fantasy and the reality. That's the essence of it. And in the movie, just like in real life, you build things. You build the things you think really matter. Like, you know there's Space Mountain? Why don't we do that actually in Buenos Aires? The problem is, what you build is actually not attached to reality, because it doesn't have to be. It's your startup. It's not attached to reality. It's amazing. You can build whatever you want, whether anybody would want a city that went up in the background like that, I don't know. But if you can imagine it, you can build it, and that's what you do. Anyone feeling a sense of maybe that's what they're doing? Have you seen people do? Remember, this is the, this is the real movie. Now, in the movie, they use a gimmick. 
age-reducing gimmick, which allows someone to tell whether or not they're in fantasy or in reality. The way you view the movie, the way, I should have asked. <laughs> Maybe I should have made a prerequisite before you show. In the movie, they introduce this gimmick, which helps someone who's in the reality, or in the fake reality they're trying to build to like, fool the guy who's in the real reality who's the customer for them. They can tell whether they're in reality or their fake reality because they spit a little top. Now, when you spin something in a fake world, the reality doesn't affect it. It's not attached to reality. It just keeps spinning. If you're in the real world, this gimmick in the movie just stops. Gravity acts on it. Friction acts on it. The real world acts on it. Well, this is what happens in startups. You build to the reality, and then you start this top spinning. That's called a launch. And then you hope something happens. You hope that your launch is somehow able to show you that you're attached to reality. And then here's what happens. A little time goes by. And a little more time goes by. And you know that office that you were dreaming about because you thought the world was going to go like this? It hasn't happened yet. In fact, nothing happens. And the reason nothing happens, the reason the top keeps spinning, is because actually when you're doing startups, the way you actually do startups, is you're not attached to the real world. <coughs> the flashpoint is not an accelerator. The flashpoint is a place that connects to reality. That's our job. That's what we're figuring out how to do. And it turns out, if you want to connect to reality, it requires you to take founders and connect them to reality. Which, by the way, is not all that pleasant to process. <laughs> Sometimes we say Flashpoint is the opposite of an incubator. An incubator is a safe place. You know, go build what you think you need to build away from the chance that the real world will screw you up. And then when you're ready, go spin your top. We don't do that. We say that's a mistake. It's the hard part is figuring out what's real. I'll give you some examples of things that we face in Flashpoint we figure that out. So here's something people think is real. Part of their, or I think it's part of their fantasy. They think that it's okay, founders, the Flashpoint shows up, most founders do. Sometimes I do my mistake. I think to myself, you know, it's possible to reason okay about my startup by reasoning that people have rational self-interest. So I'll tell you what that looks like. I watch the customer, and you know what? They're losing money every month. I went and I talked to them about what we could build for them and about how if they use our product, it would stop them using money every month. They thought to themselves, you know what, I'm rationally self-interested. Yes, if you show up with that, it would save me money every month, I would use it. Well, you know what, you can't reason from rational self-interest. That's not how people actually operate. The way people actually operate is incredibly irrational. Now, maybe they go back later and explain to themselves why it's rational to do something. But the world has this weird kind of friction, which is so hard to see that you make the mistake of reasoning with principles like this which don't work. Now the weird thing about this is even when you take somebody, even when you take yourself, and you think about how you think about the world, and you learn, yes, I get it, I can't really rely on the customer telling me that it's in their best interest to buy my product, and it's in my best interest, therefore, to build it, and I build it and I give it to them. This is an example of the rational self-interest like conveys the world. You talk like that, they want it. How do I know they want it? I ask them, they tell me they want it. I can see they buy things like that from somebody. I have all these rational arguments. Even when you learn how useless those arguments are, and how much, I'm not saying they're always useless, you know, some things do work sometimes, but, you know, basically you can't rely on it. They come back. You see, you can't kill them. That's my goal at Flashpoint. <laughs> I'm like the Buffy and the Vampire Slayer at Flashpoint. Let me give you another example. People think. They walk around, here's the reality for people in startups. I'm going to tell you it's not real. People think you need a startup, an idea to build a startup. You need a product to build a startup. They think you can't do a startup unless you have a product. They think if you have a product, you, that's what enables you to do a startup. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's just not true. That's not true. In fact, it's worse than not true. It's the opposite of true. It's like, it's worse to start with a product. You said, you're thinking, you may possibly be right about this. Well, let me give you some examples. You know, you think you need a product to find out whether a customer wants what you have. So let me play out a little scenario with you. Um, imagine it's a young father coming home from work. His young daughter 
has been playing out the playground. I'm not taking four or five. And she shows her father the mud pie. That's not going to work for me. <laughs> she, sh she shows her father the mud pie she made. It took her all day. And her father is fabulously excited by this mud pie. Does she learn that the father wanted the mud pie? That's not what's going on in an interaction. When your customer takes your thing, they buy it, you think you know why they're buying it? Your product fools you. Your product leads you in the wrong direction. It's actually somewhat worse than that. There are a lot of problems on the product. Here's a problem with the product. If you show up with a product, you think your problem is going to find somebody who wants it. There are a lot of people you can talk to. Actually, every single person you talk to knocks out one person you can talk to. So you find the next person. There are a lot of people in the world. More every day. That's not a good plan. It's a very inefficient plan. I can't seem to stop people from thinking it. I sometimes think it myself. But you know what? It's a, zo it's a zombie idea. You kill it, you don't need a product. In fact, the product gets in the way, and you don't ask me, well, I hope you have a better, I hope you have an answer for me, Eric. And I do. So. But I want you to tell, tell you this, that's a zombie idea. Here's another, I'll give you even one more zombie idea. Uh, you can validate your hypotheses about the world. Like you can figure out whether someone will be your customer by anecdote. You can go talk to them. Or you can see that this is just like something else. You know what, I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you, I mean, this is like me being a professor for a second, but I have to tell you about branding. So Flashpoint's not about the university. Our founders don't come from the university necessarily. We accept people from anywhere. We're doing something which is just legitimately value creating in the world. After the at the University now, we'll have a home there for a long time, and we think we'll expand well beyond the borders of the university. But for a moment, I'll use a word that like professors use. Can we just use the word enlightenment? You know, since the enlightenment, we know you can't figure out what's true about the world by anecdote. You know, a piece of paper flutters to the ground, brick falls faster. Therefore, and I see that all the time, therefore, heavy things fall faster than light things. I'm sorry, when you're building airplanes, anecdotes don't work. You know, we know that if you want to know what's true, if it matters, if it matters, if it matters why someone's buying something, if it matters what their actual needs are, if it matters whether your product works or not for them, that is not solvable by anecdote. Unless you want to be free enlightenment. You have, to think, you have to set up experiments and tests. You have to actually measure stuff. We know how to do this. Maybe you don't need to do it to a scientific level of standard, but you need to do it somehow. So you can't. There's another one of those zombie ideas. I figured it out, someone says to me. I went, this is what they told me, I get it now. Yeah, right, that's my sanity. Let's, let's set up an experiment. If it's really important to you, let's just go figure out how you're going to really figure out what's true about that. Okay, so then what's the alternative? What we've done is we've invented something called a way to engineer the process of startups. What does that give us? Here's what that gives us. It gives us a set of principles which are guiding principles that you can learn and operate according to that makes it possible to not do the dumb movie that of Ayn Rand of believing that you can change the world only to discover that you're actually living in inception and it's all uh, a dream. These principles are grounded. They are touchstones that we provide to ground truth. And we do this in a way that gives us practices which are enabling. That's what flashpoints are. We implement that flashpoint, the first place in the world, as far as I know, that does anything like this. We implement that flashpoint, a process that enables us to help people change their mindsets about how they do startups. And it's important. I'll give you some examples of some principles or some practices. Here's one. Okay, you can't rely on people to be self, uh, be rationally uh, self -interested. You can't. You know, they can, yes, you can clearly see that they'd be better off with it than without it. They still don't buy it. So what can you rely on? I feel like I'm going to be beat up by English teachers. <laughs> well, here's what you can rely on. It's going to seem ridiculous, but it's going to actually be true if you can get it in your head. You can rely that people will do the things that they cannot not do. You, you'd like an erase the double knot. doesn't work. Because here's the way it actually works. If you can figure out what people can't avoid, OK, they can't avoid doing it. Oh, that means they're doing it. Your job is to find out what they can't avoid. That's your job, not why they would do something. What can't they avoid doing? That you can rely on. I'm not saying people only do the things that they, that they, that they can't not do. I'm saying if you want to build something, you can rely on their not being able to do things they can't do. They can't not do. Even <laughs> All right, here's another one. Uh, you know, you want to figure out what you should build. 
Well, figure out what you can avoid doing. How do you tell? Well, my customers don't seem to care. It doesn't have any effect on the world. It doesn't fit anything. I can't show myself any theory that says doing that matters. So find out what you can avoid doing. And just don't do that. Here's another one. Just, this is interesting. You know, you think, most people run around trying to get customers to buy stuff. I think that's a bad idea. I think when they buy stuff, you don't really know what happened. Here's a better plan, and this works. You're going to think this is nuts, but it works. Go try to get your customers to prove to you that they can't buy your product. Get them to prove to you. How do they prove it to you? All sorts of ways. They stop talking to you. They're on meetings with you. They, they ask you how much it's going to cost us in buying. They complain. They do all sorts of things. Just keep doing that until you really manage to completely fail at it. Because the minute you fail at it, guess what? They're buying your product because they can no longer prove to you that they can't or won't. I know that sounds crazy. But if you go back and look and figure out what you did if you were successful in startup, that's what you did. Now, here's some of the other principles we have. It's possible to figure out whether there's demand for your product. I'll tell you what it feels like, actually. When it feels right, when it feels, because we have uh, many examples now of flash points from our first two batches and now from our second batch. They experience this. Here's what it feels like when you have demand for your product. People show up, follow you home, demanding product that you have not built. That's what it feels like. It feels like they need you, they want you, they hunger for something, and you have no product to sell them. That's what demand feels like. And I'm telling you, you can do that without a product that's easier. And you can do that by meticulously mapping customer pain in a special way which we do that. And we're going to get that out. This journey that we've taken over the last year and a half has taken us to a very interesting place. I think we now know what the job of the founder is. I think we know what the job of an innovator is. Actually, I think we know what the work is, actually, literally. And I think we know what the, that means we know what the job of an entrepreneur is. Should I stop now? Let me tell you what it is. The job of a founder or an innovator or an entrepreneur is to become that thing in the world that enables customers. Your customers, what makes you have a right to be in the world is that they have an improvement goal that they can't achieve on their own. How do they achieve it? You have to change. Becoming is change. The, one of the things that makes startup, and startup so hard and startup engineering so difficult is recognizing that you must change if you want to enable your customers. You must change, they are not going to change. You become that thing. It's a thing, it's a product, it's you, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something. It's whatever it needs to be that enables customers to what? Enables customers so that they can change. Because the fundamental difficulty in the world is that customers, even if they have improvement goals, have difficulty changing. So what you do is you figure out how to change yourself to become that thing that enables, makes it possible for them to change to be what? To be more of who they are. Because what their, what their desire is and what their want is, is fundamentally to figure out how to be who they are given the constraints of who they have to be. Flashpoint founders, what do I have here to offer you today? What do we, what do we have here to offer you? What do we have to offer the Flashpoint team? What do we have to offer the world is this. We have now worked with close to 100, maybe some more than 100 uh, founders who have learned how to be different in the world. But what these teams are doing out of Flashpoint is legitimate work. It's not with the Starbucks Foundation, the PwC, even non-for-profits have gone through. I thought I was in trouble the first batch when we accelerated a non-for-profit accelerator for the Silicon Accelerator. Because uh, what the definition of a bubble must be, accelerators, accelerators, accelerators. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for being here.